uh, Melissa Atchison, and her talk will be Cows, Crops, and Conservation Ag. Melissa uh, was raised in the Interlake region of Manitoba, so we've gone from the southwest up to the, well, northeast, so to speak, and is on a purebred Charlet operation, a common theme, I think. Uh, she graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, specializing in animal science in 2007. Soon after graduating, she began an eight-year career with Manitoba Agriculture as a livestock specialist. She is currently the Verified Beef Production Plus and Provincial Coordinator, sorry, Provincial Coordinator and the District 6 Director for Manitoba Beef Producers. Together with her husband, Trevor, and his family, they own and operate Poplar View uh, stock farms consisting of 700 head cow herd, a backgrounding lot, and approximately 600 acres of cropland. Melissa. Thank you, Doug. Um, yes, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the invitation uh, to participate in the panel discussion today, and I've really enjoyed the other talks, and I can't wait till we get into the uh, question period. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. So yeah, like Doug was saying, I grew up in the Interlake region of Manitoba, but now currently I'm down in Southwest Manitoba. So our farm uh, is a century farm. We were established in 1900. That's when uh, Trevor's great, great, great grandparents uh, purchased the first section of the land uh, and it's still our home quarter today. We are currently, our kids are the fifth generation on the farm, my kids and um, Trevor's sister's children as well. So like Doug mentioned, we calve out approximately 700 cows, give or take every year. We have about 600 acres of annual crop production and about 2,700 acres of hay, as well as 5,000 acres of pasture. And then we background our calves um, in a backgrounding lot. Next slide, please. So when we talk about integrating um, cattle and crops, for so management of soil health and promoting soil health. I think for our operation in particular, grazing management and winter feeding strategies are just an absolute keystone of our operation. So um, we do tons of rotational grazing, lots of um, move, animal movement. Um, fencing is the never ending job. It is constant. Um, we always seem to have uh, summer crew fencing, ripping out old fence, putting up new fence. Next slide, please. So here's some more examples um, of uh, our, uh, <laughs> our quads take a beating there <laughs> on the road a lot, uh, moving cows, checking cows, uh, working, checking fence. Um, so we like to manage our animals and our grass to maximize the carrying capacity of our land and, and we, we try to increase our turnover so we, we can run more cows on the same amount of acres uh, as opposed to, um, you know, maybe running higher value animals. So we're more about the turnover. Uh, so if we can, you know, decrease our cow size to have a moderate frame, smaller cow with a low input and perhaps maybe a low output, but increase the number of those cows we're able to put on the land because we've increased the carrying capacity. That's kind of, that's the goal of our operation. Next slide, please. Um, so that was our summer kind of thing is our rotational grazing system. As far as winter and fall, we try to do a lot of stockpile grazing and extended season grazing. So that's the picture on the left. We have a big stockpile of forage in that photo. If you notice in the cat and the nose is of those calves is um, quiet weans. So that's part of our weaning strategy is using the quiet weans. And on the right, you, you'll see a picture of uh, swath grazing. So I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, we, our cows are never in confinement, the cow herd is never in confinement, only on processing days. Um, they are out on the land 365 days a year. The only time our animals are in confinement are the um, feeder calves. Next slide, please. So I think one of the biggest things that has a big impact on our soil health here is our winter feeding management. So we, in the last several years, we've started bale grazing quite intensively. So we use extensive winter feeding management 
our soil here runs the gamut from um, we have some borderline valley land, but I mean, I'm not talking Red River Valley, <laughs> Pipestone Valley. Um, but then we run all the way to st Sand Hills. So we have land that looks very similar to like Spruce Woods Park. You wouldn't know that uh, that you weren't there if you were standing on it. So we have cactuses, pincushion cactuses. Um, so we have very blowy sensitive land. We also have lots of low-lying areas and marsh. So this land in this picture, um, we chose this bale grazing site this year. There's about 460 cows out on it. That land is very yellow blow sand, very hilly. Um, as I'm moving the wires, <clears throat> excuse me, I've noticed, I know why we chose this site because it's very unproductive pasture land. It's really petered out. There are mummified <laughs> white cow patties out there that have not, you know, on a healthy pasture, we like to see that disappear within a day or two. It turns to sawdust, right? And the bugs do their work. So we knew that, that, that uh, it needed some bale grazing. So we use bale grazing as a way to import or redistribute nutrients and soil microbes around the farm and a way to build our, as a way to build organic matter. Next slide, please. So here's an example of, um, this is our bale grazing site. I took a picture after I moved the wire. This is what it looks like after the cows have moved along. So the cows are behind me in this photo. Um, just to show you kind of what's left behind on our operation. It's so dependent on, um, I hear a lot of comments about potential waste and I don't see the residue as a waste because the intention was to leave something behind to build organic matter in that soil. So. Um, the amount left behind is very really dependent on the quality of the um, bales that are put out there. Our, our cows, especially on this herd, this is our mature um, older cows. We don't calve until June, May and June, so they're not, you know, they're only in first and second trimester. We don't have to give them the uh, uh, best quality and quantity of feed. They can subside on pretty pretty poor quality feed. So there is a tendency to leave more behind. Uh, with a lower quality feed just because you can't force them to eat that much. But if you had a bit higher quality feed, they'd clean it up quite a bit better. The picture on the right is um, what a, a, one of our bale grazing sites looked like two summers later. So you can see some faint spots there where there's some residue um, left from old core, cores of bales. But um, this pasture was quite a similar. It was unproductive, very petered out. It had been um, continuous grazed by horses for many years before we got it. So um, the grazing mechanism of a horse is quite severe compared to cows. So uh, this is what we were able to achieve, uh, you know, from a yellow, sandy, blowy hilltop pasture to, uh, to some pretty green, nice pasture with just importing some nutrients uh, in the form of bale grazing. Next slide, please. Here's another example. So uh, this is in the same paddock, uh, just to show you what it looks like after. We do not um, heavy harrow after we don't harrow it. We just leave it. Um, we haven't found a lot of benefit to harrowing. So we have a tendency to just leave it behind and let it do its thing. But it's been an excellent way to build soil capacity uh, and organic matter. And it's really helped change the, you know, the water holding and infiltration capacity of these, these unproductive pastures. Next slide, please. So this is a, one of the more, I would say, unique things that we do in terms of winter feeding management. Um, we like silage as a feed. There's no better way to put up a very high volume and a very consistent high quality feed in a very short period of time. Uh, but also in my mind, there's no more expensive feed to feed, if that makes sense. So um, we've been trying this method for a couple years. We learned this from a fellow up in Lenore country named Pat Waller. He kind of taught us this and we took it on a bigger scale and, and ran away with it and we have really enjoyed it. So in these photos, we're grazing a silage pile. So we will grow our silage crop and we will pack it in the field. Um, we'll make a pile and um, we'll make it lower, like a lower profile. So it's only maybe six feet high. And uh, we will put an electric fence around it and then run aircraft cable around, down the front. And that is a, um, acts as a bunk. It's a moving bunk. So we limit access. This is where we put our other herd of cows that are, are you know, 
first calf heifers, they're recovering from having a calf, they're still growing. This is also where we will put our um, cows that maybe need a little bit of extra TLC, just our more poor doers. So yeah, it's a good way to do that. So these are also adjacent to a bale grazing site. So they're just supplemented with this silage um, because they need a little bit better groceries. But yeah, this is a really, a really fun way we have found, <laughs> if you could use that, but a, a very low cost and a low labor way to feed silage on a cow herd. Next slide, please. As far as our cropping is concerned, our main priority, again, we're very sandy soil. So we um, try really hard to keep it covered um, because it's very, very prone to wind erosion, very prone to water erosion. And then we also want to build that organic matter to increase our um, moisture holding capacity. So our goal is to keep something actively growing for as much of the year as possible. So we want roots in that soil growing as much as the year as we can. So we've started recently doing poly crops. So um, I, this is, these next few slides are gonna dovetail really nicely with Yvonne's uh, and give you some examples of what works on our operation. Uh, we use perennials, biennials, and then we'll do annual crop for cash, cash flow purposes. Certainly we're not strangers to growing canola around here. I wish we would have <laughs> put it in bins and hauled it this past week rather than me taking it in the fall, but here we are, hindsight's 2020. Um, so sometimes we use annual crops also as a way to, you know, renovate a rough field. We have a terrible problem with uh, moles and Richardson ground squirrels here, and we have some fields where if you even tried to drive across them, you'd, probably, you'd crack your teeth. They're just awful. So that's one of the ways we'll renovate those pastures or fields. Um, we also might use that as a way to um, get ahead of undesirable grass species and as we want to renovate them. So the first year we'll probably put in a cereal uh, that has a bit bigger seed, and then the next year maybe canola, and then the year after that, um, so the canola will get ahead of any undesirable grass species that might get away on us. And then the next year we'll, we'll have it back down into perennial crop or uh, perennial forages. So that's kind of part of the crop rotation. I joke all the time that bottom left photo, <laughs> we identify as ranchers and not farmers based on the age of that equipment. So if anybody local knows the scrap pile at two in 10, um, I always joke that the equipment that's in that scrap pile is newer than the equipment we are using on the farm. <laughs> So um, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the polycrops that we were using. Um, so on May 15th this past year, we seeded a mix of oats, barley, fall rye, hairy vetch, yellow clover, flax, forage piece, crown millet, forage rape. It was just a pile uh, of just a, this is the first time we've really went all in with a really, really, really diverse mixture. Uh, then on June 8th, we seeded oats, barley, fall rye, hairy vetch, turnip, forage ripe, radish, crown millet, German millet. Um, the reason for the two seeding dates is because the cutworms really liked it. <laughs> there was a pretty bad problem with cutworms this year in our uh, area of the province. And so that's what happened there. Um, next slide, please. So of the... For our polycrop, we had about 160 acres of total that we cut for silage this year. So 100 of that we chopped, um, and then we wanted to graze the regrowth. Unfortunately, there wasn't a, a much regrowth. We were in a very bad drought. We had very, very uh, dry conditions this past summer. Um, we had a bit of pickings there, but uh, because it was so poor on the regrowth, it was less than we expected. We kind of on an angle seeded some fall rye into it. Um, hoping to get some regrowth there. Uh, then we did 45 acres of oats underseeded with alfalfa for silage. That's another example of how we will, um, you know, have crop growing as much of the year as possible. So we'll harvest the oats and then we'll use that as, you know, the oats are a companion crop or a nurse crop to establish alfalfa. Um, we understand that it, we might lose some productivity there because they're two competing crops, but I think it's a means to an end as a way to establish that, that forage that we want to be there. Uh, we also had 100 acres of, uh, that we seeded in 2019 of some polycrop. Um, 
so 60 acres was rye with vetch that we chopped in July. And then when we once we took off the silage crop, we seeded oats and vetch and radish to graze. And then 40 acres of that um, was rye with winter wheat, vetch and clover. And then once that was taken off, we seeded it with oats and vetch again. So um, we just, like I said, we try to keep something growing for as much of this the year as possible. Um, and then we did 45 acres of annuals that were, uh, so we had millet, oats, barley, fall rye, kale, turnip, and radish. And we had some um, grass or heifers out there that we moved four times a day and they did tremendously well on that. Um, and the, that again was some kind of sensitive soil that needed a bit of action on it, a bit of um, nutrients added to it. And like with those turnips, those brassicas really put stuff back in the soil and just that um, high impact with that amount of animals on it on the manure distribution was really, really good for that land. And then we have some examples here. Uh, I'm not an agronomist, so, <laughs> uh, but I, I do think these are some really interesting photos of what we got to grow in such a dry year. So I found it really interesting um, how much moisture that crop was able to capture, even though we didn't have a very good year for, we had a couple of timely rains. I'm not gonna say that we did this magically, um, but the amount of moisture we had and the productivity we got, we were quite happy with it. And then also the diversity and the, the soil improvements that we got were really, really excellent as well. And that's just uh, subjectively speaking. I, we didn't measure anything per se as far as soil health is concerned, but uh, next slide, please. Are the slides not changing? Uh, we can go back one, please. Okay. Yeah, here's some more examples. Okay, we've already covered this. These are some more examples of the polycrop. These are the radishes and some of the vetches, or sorry, excuse me, the brassicas that grew. So next slide, please. My apologies, there was just a comment there about the slides maybe not advancing, but they are for me. And then another comment saying that they were. So um, that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. It's not meant to be uh, prescriptive. Yvonne kind of alluded to that. It's not a, a one size fits all. It's so dependent on your soil and your conditions in your area. It's more of an outcome based thing. So we aren't afraid to try some crazy stuff every once in a while to see what we can get going. But, um, you know, we, we want this land. It's been here for 121 years. We want it to be for another 120 for our family. So um, these are the ways that we've been trying to evolve and change and, and do that to keep these soils productive and healthy for years to come. Thank you.